Please welcome Jeremy K. How are you all doing? You're doing good? How did they put me after that guy? That's not fair. Um, who remembers this? Who had this? A few hands. Remember carrying it around? Watch this video. We'll remind you. Finding a phone in a car isn't that unusual anymore, except when it leaves the car for greener pastures, the high seas, or a leisurely lunch. Radio Shack keeps you in constant communication with their affordable, transportable cellular telephone. Hello? Oh, yes, he's right here. It's for you. Yes, I heard about the merger. 500 shares. Um, who has one of these? Put your hand up. Come on, that's not enough hands. Who has a smartphone? All right. Who has more than one smartphone in their pockets right now? A lot of people. We're at a security conference. So December 2014, there was a turning point. Uh, that was the moment where in society, there were more mobile phone subscriptions than there were people in the world. Pretty impressive. Um, a, su a survey of college students on American campuses last year, July 2017, found that students between the ages of 18 and 34 had seven inter internet connected devices. That's the world that we're living in. Now, what's interesting is that as the number of devices grow, the potential for malware increases rapidly. Gartner make a very, very bold prediction in their report, in their mobile threat defense report from last year. They come along and say by 2019, mobile malware will amount for one third of all malware. That's a game changer. That's something that we're not paying attention to right now. And we need to think about that. And that's what we're going to do today. Now, we're not the only ones that like cell phones. The other people that like cell phones are the bad guys. And what we're going to explore is a very simple equation. And that equation is about understanding the motivation, the hacker's motivation of why mobile devices are so attractive for them. We're going to take a couple of parameters. Number one is the number of devices that a hacker can infect in a single campaign. That's our first parameter. The second parameter is the amount of time I can have that malware out there on these devices before it gets detected. That's our second thing. The combination of those is very simple. It's money. It's the big Bitcoin. It's what all the hackers are looking for. That's the motivation. So let's explore each one of those in one go. Familiar with WannaCry, we've all spoken about it. Gil mentioned it at the beginning. So WannaCry, for all its devastation, and WannaCry was huge, it infected 300,000 endpoints. Only 300,000. You take a look at mobile malware campaigns like Judy, like Gooligan, like Hummingbird, the number of infected devices were in the millions. Now copycats, which is another mobile malware campaign, which, by the way, will take the opportunity to do a shout out to Checkpoint Threat Research Team because they discovered Copycat back last year in 2017. So a big shout out to those guys. So Copycat infected over 14 million devices. Now, Copycat itself, we think, well, if you're familiar with Copycat, it's about adware, mobile adware. And they just wanted to generate revenue from injecting adware into these devices, and they were collecting money from that. That's fine. But as a result of that malware campaign, they managed to root 8 million Android devices around the world. So from a hacker's perspective, that's not what they're after. They're after the money. But actually, the net result for us as businesses that are bringing mobile devices into our businesses and giving them access to our data we now have another 8 million rooted devices that we need to deal with. If you compare the number, that's 45 times more 
endpoints being impacted by copycat than WannaCry. Yet WannaCry makes the news. Let's take a look at that second parameter, duration. So Judy and, Hamming and Hummingbat, by the time that they were discovered, it had been 12 months. That's the amount of time that Judy and Hummingbat were on our devices until it was actually picked up. By contrast, WannaCry and Petya, they weren't only discovered, but they were discovered and stopped in a matter of days. So duration is a huge motivational factor for hackers, why mobile is so act attractive for them. I can either spread malware and it can be on devices for a year, or I could spread malware and it'll be on devices for a day. I know what I'd go after. Now, of course, the combination, if we make that comparison, the combination is very easy. Like we said, the net result is about money. So WannaCry netted $130,000 of Bitcoin. That doesn't mean it wasn't a huge disruptor to the industry, because it was. But in terms of financial value to the hackers, and of course, we can track that, because all these digital wallets now can be monitored. And we know that's the amount of money that they got in terms of Bitcoin. If we take a look at copycats, that netted one and a half million dollars, 11 times the amount of money. Now, of course, there's nothing new with this, right? This is the hacker's formula, because what the hackers just do all the time is that they identify the areas of least resistance and high profitability. And today, that's mobile devices. And that's how they're going to attack our businesses. Um, the hacker's motivation is perhaps the easier part to explain. What is harder to try and understand is the lack of industry response. And that's what I want to do, a little exercise with you guys. Anyone like basketball? Any guys are ball players? Yeah? All right. We're going to do a very, very simple exercise. I'm going to have a video. I'm not worried about the sound, although it would be nice if the sound worked. All I want you to do, there's two teams playing basketball. There's a team dressed in white, and there's a team dressed in black. And I want you to watch the team dressed in white and count how many times they pass the ball between each other. All right, sounds simple? All right, let's see if we can get this working. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! Simple exercise. Who found eight? Who found more than eight? Ten? Who found ten? Who found eleven? Twelve? Thirteen? Anyone more than thirteen? All right, so you've done really well. The actual answer is thirteen, so well done those that counted thirteen. But that's actually not the question. What the question is, is how many of you saw the dancing bear in the middle of the basketball players? It's got about 3%. You don't believe me there was a dancing bear in the middle? All right, let's rewind that. Let's take a look. Go! Doing a bit of a Michael Jackson moonwalk. Coming off the stage. So something so obvious, if we don't pay it attention, ends up not being noticed until it's too late. You guys are not going to forget that dancing bear. Uh, Lazarus, Lazarus Group, amazing group of hackers, allegedly, uh, allegedly from North Korea. Um, these guys were obsessed with Bitcoin, right? And these guys were, these guys are behind the. Uh, the attacks on, or again, allegedly behind the attacks on uh, the big Sony hack, the Swift network, WannaCry. These are guys behind that. Um, and what they wanted, they wanted to go after Ubit. Anyone familiar with Ubit? Ubit is like the Federal Reserve for cryptocurrency. So Ubit is uh, South Korea's cryptocurrency exchange. So when you want to kind of get rich from hacking, and you can go after one Bitcoin here and there. That's one approach. Or you can go after the whole exchange. And that's what these guys did. Now, Ubit had over a billion dollars of cryptocurrency locked within its 
cyber vaults. And of course, they're not just obsessed with money, UBIT's obsessed with security, and there's multiple layers of defense. What they needed to do was to try and identify what was the weakest part and the way that they could get into that. And of course, it was a mobile phone. And the way that they did that was that they sent fake messages to IT staff asking people to download an application, which was malicious in its very nature. Um, and by the time that they managed to do that and actually get these um, malware on the devices, they'd managed to bypass the two-factor authentication that the IT staff were using and gave them full access to the IT servers. Now, the net result of that was catastrophe. UBIT lost $100 million of cyber currency. They went bankrupt. It's a horrible story, and it's because of these. Now, we could say, well, that was allegedly North Korean cyber criminals, and you know, what about the average day-to-day -day company? What about you and me? So Checkpoint did a really interesting study last year. We took a look at 850 of our customers that had Samblas Mobile, which is our mobile threat defense solution, installed in their environments. We took a look at 850 customers that had over 500 devices with the software deployed. What we found was startling. First thing we found was that every single company without fail had some mobile malware installed in their environments. That's not like we found 3% of companies where it could be some edge case. We're talking about every single company had some devices infected with mobile malware. On average, 54 malware events per company. To highlight this, I'm going to do a quick demo with you guys, OK? Now, we're all in Vegas. A lot of us flew in. Imagine you get in to, a, uh, to an airport, and you want to get on Wi-Fi. We want to download emails. We've just got off the plane. We want to speak to our spouses, whatever it is we want to do. Um, and as we arrive at the airport, we get a message from the airport, as we often do, saying, hey, we're going to give you free Wi-Fi. Awesome. Uh, we take a look. We click on it. We install a profile. Classic human psychology. Give me something to click on, and I'll say yes to that. What that profile allows the hackers to do is to conduct a full man-in-the-middle attack on my phone. Now, this actually leverages a known vulnerability on iOS. I know we all love to talk about that Android is super unsecure and iOS is super secure. This is a known vulnerability on iOS. Uses a vulnerability known as Sidestepper, which has actually existed for a few years. So with that, once my in device is infected, the hackers are now able to actually install a malicious application on my phone. I'm actually going to open my phone. Going to open that up. So we can see it's now it's loading up on the, uh, on the device. There we go, mobile conference application. This is what we're talking about. Now, what I don't know, of course I do know, but what I don't realize is that behind the scenes, I've got my great friend, Tomer Greenbaum, and he's going to be our hacker for the day. And what he's going to do is that he's going to activate an attack on my phone. All right, so that's what he's going to do. So you can see this is Thomas' command and control center. We're actually looking at his computer right now. He's attacking my phone. What we'll now see is that we'll see him going to his email. And what the malware is actually doing is collecting information from my device. So he's received email number one. And what we can see here, thank you, Tomer, he's actually managed to extract all the contacts for my phone. It's number one. He can tell, find out where I am. So we've got my GPS location. He can click on that, and let's see where we are. That's right. We're in the Venetian Hotel. We're in Vegas. Uh, he can see stuff like my um, what operating system, all my device information. And he can also see my calendar. Now imagine this. Imagine now the hackers, they've got access to my phone, they know where I am, they know what I'm doing, they know what meetings I've got. It would now be very easy for them to say, hey, that's an interesting meeting, I want to listen in on what's going on. And the hackers can do this.
It's pretty easy. Um, Tom has now received another email. That's some scary stuff. Thank you, Toma. Um, but the great news is we can help you. Okay, Samblas Mobile, the solution we spoke about, it's the leading threat defense solution to protect against advanced mobile cyber attacks. Now, let's shift gears a little. We've spoken about why it's important. I hope by now we all get it. And even if I wasn't on the stage, I hope you all got that already. What I want to talk about is why it should be a priority for you guys in 2018. All right, so let's talk about that. Making mobile device security priority. Number one, if we're going to provide access to our employees to data, we need to secure it. That's not new. That's just in the same way. We provide access to our employees to lots of things. We need to secure it. That's what Brittany was talking about before from AMC. We need to know what's going on. So if we're taking a corporate decision, which many of us are doing, where we want to mobilize our workforce because we want to increase productivity and efficiency of our employees, we need to do it in a secure way, okay? Now, this should be standard for us. It should be part of our security policy. It should be part of our security audits. Wherever we're putting our data, we need to protect it. So that's number one. Number two, we're all using these things 24-7. We're accessing our SaaS applications, Box, Gmail, personal accounts, Salesforce. We're accessing lots of stuff. If my phone can be hijacked, and it's pretty easy to do that, then all of my account credentials can also be stolen too. Once they've got that, my access to corporate data is now not just about my device, but it's also about data that I've got in the cloud. We're making and exposing that data. Third, if that wasn't enough, this is just something we have to do. Privacy and security laws demand that we do this. Okay, whether it's GDPR or whether it's HIPAA for healthcare, or whether it's ISO or NIST federal requirements. A device is a device. Our data we need to protect wherever it is. Okay, so it's not enough to say that we didn't know. All of the privacy and security laws extend to mobile devices. Fourthly, employee protection. Many of us are living in a BYOD world. BYOD, bring your own device. When we actually encourage our employees to bring in their own phones. Once we do that and we say, hey, we're going to save money on buying the phone. You guys bring in the phone and we're going to give you access to corporate data. But now because of the fact that they're an employee of the company, their phones are now at an increased risk because people want to get access into that information. But now their personal data is also at risk. So if we're going to be in a BYOD world and we're going to ask people to bring in their phones, we have an obligation to protect our employees' cell phones and to protect their private data. So let's summarize. And with that, I'll hand over to the next speaker. Number one, hacker motivation hasn't changed. They're always going to look for the areas of the least resistance and high profitability. That hasn't changed. We all want to mobilize our workforce, but in doing so, we're exposing our data. And at the moment we expose our data, we have a duty of care to protect that data. We're not talking about something futuristic. This is about here and now. We're not talking about like Pablos was talking about, you know, things, you know, there's a futurist, you know, the direction of the world. This is about today, malware being spread across devices, and we're simply not doing anything. So put your hand up again, who's got a smartphone? Let's see those hands again. All right, let's get those devices protected. Thank you very much.